Well, I think perhaps the best place to start this narrative would be on a summer night in 1934 at Town's Hospital, that famous drying out emporium in New York where I had so often been. On this occasion, I was there next to my last time, and the news was all bad. I knew that you were talking to the doctor downstairs, dear old Dr. Silkworth, who has become enshrined in our hearts in all the years since as nothing less than a medical saint. I never will forget his telling me that you were absolutely hopeless, that he had once hoped, he'd once thought that there was hope, but now he was afraid I would have to commit you or you would die of alcoholism or go insane. He had intimated that to me before, as you well know, that this could be the end of the line. But up until this point, I had had some hope myself. As you remember, he had described alcoholism to us as a sort of terrible compulsion to drink against one's will, against one's happiness, and against one's best interest. A compulsion not too often under, uh, overcome by an individual on his own resources. Attached to this, he thought there was a physical condition, an allergy, so that if the drinking persisted, it eventually meant insanity or death. And meanwhile, great desolation indeed, uh, which had been our lot. I well remember leaving the hospital after this fatal sentence had been passed upon me and indeed upon you. This time, I had a fear of alcohol that I had never known it in such an intensity before. And I suppose it was mainly fear and constant vigilance that kept me sober for the next few months. I remember how you made every effort, how we went on many walks, how we read together, how we exerted every possible resource we could to combat this thing. Then I remember how I began to feel better, how confidence returned, though false confidence it proved to be. Little by little, the horror of the experience of Towns lessened, almost disappeared. I even went back over to Wall Street and was able to pick up a few dollars. Perhaps things weren't so hopeless as the doctor had said. Then came that day when you had to work in the department store. It was November 11th, 1934, Armistice Day. And I proposed to go to Staten Island to play some golf all by myself. I, of course, thought that, well, I've certainly got to make it this time. But no, again I was stricken. Again I vaguely remember faces and buses and then oblivion. And then comes a part of the story that I don't remember, but which you certainly must. Well, I found, I found you in the area way, I remember, with a great gash across your face and dragging the golf clubs. You certainly was a, well, a sad looking sight. And I had to take you in and put you to bed. 
I guess you even had a lot of trouble getting me upstairs. When I came around this time, I was truly hopeless. For the first time, I could see myself as a denizen of a mental hospital. For perhaps a week, I drank on. And if that were possible, the utter hopelessness of our situation was borne in on me. I seldom left the house except to get gin. I was either on my bed asleep or downstairs in the kitchen, my favorite drinking spot. While there on a bleak afternoon in that month of November, the telephone suddenly rang. I went and I heard the voice of an old school friend the one now so well and affectionately known to AA as Ebby. I asked him to come over, sensing, however, that he was in New York sober. I couldn't remember a time when he had paid such a visit. Soon he was at the outer door. I looked through the grating at him and even in my haze, I at once perceived that something extraordinary had happened. He greeted me very cheerily. I stumbled inside. We sat at the kitchen table. I pushed across to him a pitcher of gin flavored with pineapple juice. And at this point, he shook his head and with a smile said, well, I'm not drinking just now. Well, this mystified and also disappointed me. I thought that he and I could retreat into the past. 